Our government can be blamed for many things. We hold them to account for many things. Arguably, with regards to our own country, it is in a bit of a sorry state. But there is something that is, in my opinion, going unnoticed. Its counterpart, genocide, we all know about. But our practices by our very own government could fall into one category, come under one definition, and it could be considered very worrying. Have you ever heard of democide? Democide is a term revived and redefined by American political scientist R.J. Rummel as the murder of any person or people by their government. But while our government, namely at the moment the Conservative Party, there are times that they are very much doing things that could fall under this term, come under this definition. Rummel's definition includes large-scale killings either by racial intentions or as a result of political policies. But one other thing that is considered as democide is deaths arising from intentionally or knowingly reckless and depraved disregard for life. This brings into account many deaths arising through various neglects and abuses, such as forced mass starvation. Some examples of democide classed by Rummel include the great purges carried out by Joseph Stalin in the Soviet Union, the deaths from the colonial policy in the Congo Free State, and of course Mao Zedong's Great Leap Forward, which resulted in a famine, killing millions of people. According to Rummel, these were not cases of genocide because those who were killed were not selected on the basis of their race but were killed in large numbers as a result of government policies. Famine is classed by Rummel as democide if it fits the definition as I've just explained. Food banks have doubled under the Tories and towards the end I will give you a record of a few cases of pure neglect by our very own government. But according to Rummel, cases under democide surpassed war as the leading cause of non-natural death in the 20th century. One famous case of democide was reclassified as such, was for instance Mao Zedong's democide in 2005. Rummel originally believed that Mao's policies were largely responsible for the famine, but that Mao's advisers had originally misled him. So take the hunger crisis we have in Britain, and I say crisis because in December 2013, according to a group of doctors and academics writing in the British Medical Journal, hunger in the UK had reached the level of a public health emergency. And according to a 2016 report by the Food Foundation, over 8 million Britons experienced either moderate or severe food insecurity in 2014. Over 4 million faced severe food insecurity. The report was based on UN data, but due to the fairly small survey size, its results should only be considered indicative, apparently. Also, they say, facing even severe food insecurity doesn't necessarily mean one is experiencing chronic hunger. Depends how much food you would normally eat on a daily basis, I guess. But people just going hungry at home isn't the only case of starvation, and believe it or not, dehydration. It actually happens within some of the services that are run by our government. Take the NHS for example. Now do you remember when Theresa May disregarded completely the announcement by the British Red Cross that the NHS was in a state of humanitarian crisis? Last week, Mr Speaker, 485 people in England spent more than 12 hours on trolleys in hospital corridors. The Red Cross described this as a humanitarian crisis. I called on the Prime Minister to come to Parliament on Monday. She didn't. She sent the Health Secretary. But does she agree with him that the best way to solve the crisis of the four-hour wait is to fiddle the figures so that people are not seen to be waiting so long on uh, trolleys in NHS hospitals? We've all seen humanitarian crises around the world. And to use that description of a National Health Service, which which last year saw two and a half million more people treated in an accident and emergency than six years ago was irresponsible and overblown. Well, whilst this was going on, they declared that 
two patients every day die of either starvation or dehydration in their very own hospitals and care homes. According to the Office of National Statistics, malnutrition or dehydration were mentioned on the death certificates of 726 patients who died in hospital in 2015 and of 130 more who passed away in care homes. Now a report was also done by a media source and they found that in hospitals 297 patients died of starvation and 429 of dehydration while in care homes. 54 died of hunger and 76 of thirst. The government is knowingly holding and withdrawing funds from making cuts to these services. But those are shocking figures and given the de definition of democide, could this fall under this term? But as I said at the top, democide can also include deaths arising from intentionally or knowingly reckless and depraved disregard for life. People rely on money. We use money for food and to keep ourselves afloat throughout life. We all know the use of money and what it does. So is denying people money, or certainly enough to live on, be classed as democide? Cuts are being made to benefits of all sorts of kind. Many people are made to struggle on a little tiny amount. Many try to complain and sometimes their complaints go unheard. But some people in the past have taken drastic measures to exit their dire situation that they're in. Some people think that suicide is the better option. And whether we think that that action is right or wrong, we can't know the answer until we've been there ourselves. Now I've said before many times in previous videos, I've been there. Although it did not get as serious as me wanting to exit this world, I did go hungry for a few days a week and I didn't have any money and that went on for nearly 18 months about six years ago. But as of 2015, nearly 400 Brits died from malnutrition or hunger. Remember, we are a first world country. And more exact figures from the Office of National Statistics show that 391 people died from malnutrition in 2015 a leap of 27% compared with nine years earlier. The statistics also show two Brits are admitted to hospital with the condition every day in what campaigners have called a national scandal. And there were 746 admissions for malnutrition in just 12 months through 2015, according to the official government figures. No money to buy or get through the result of the benefit cuts. Then you starve. Isn't that intentionally or knowingly reckless and depraved disregard for life? The UK's biggest food bank network, the um, Trussell Trust, provided more than a million free day food supplies in 2016, including 415,000 plus to children, that many food parcels to children. Some foods that before people would buy in general in their weekly shop are now considered luxuries. And statistics show that 17% of adults at any one time are concerned about running out of food before more can even be bought. Now is it me or am I wrong in saying that some of what is to blame is government policy? But jumping now on the modern age of democide steps forward to geographers Canadian geographers Porteous and Smith, they first conceived the concept in 2001 that they want democide reclassified and bring its definition into the modern age. They want to reclassify democide as such the intentional destruction of home. But in the current global socio-political landscape, democide and its impact is large present in both the global north and south and spanning a variety of scales from mass displacement through the Syrian civil war to the much talked about controversial UK housing policy, especially since Grenfell. It has been underrepresented in critical geographies of home literature. This new paper calls for a resurrection and recasting of the term, highlighting the multitude of contexts in which rethinking democide provides an important contribution towards the expansion of critical geographies of home scholarship. The paper focuses on four areas of geography in which scholars have begun to explore and extend the term. 
there is in fact many cases with regards to homes and as they term it unhoming or the term what could also be related as some call it social cleansing one such case happened in 2012 to a mr jason paul he was in temporary accommodation with his ill daughter split up from his partner but lived in the Waltham forest borough most of his life he was told yes he was told to move to Warsaw away from a possible support network and not able to see his other two sons on a regular basis and it would no doubt be too far to travel. He was also told in a roundabout way I guess that if he didn't go he and his ill daughter would be out on the streets. Now a book called Democide in the Coalition Austerity, Citizenship and Moralities of Forced Eviction in Inner London explains just that and I quote the democidal impact of two UK housing policies implemented by the 2010 and 15 Conservative Liberal Democrat government, the criminalisation of squatting and the bedroom tax. Through these case studies, the notion of democide is extended to consider the ways in which it is utilised as a technology of governance. When you look at it, I mean really look at it, there could be cases all over the world they are not being classed as democide and certainly in our own country. Could some of the practices that our government is implementing through policies fall under the hat of democide? Now in relation to the acts of Stalin and Mayor Zedong, the numbers of deaths through the examples I've mentioned would have to be high, very high, to maybe classed as democide. But we're on our way, aren't we? Such a small amount of deaths though have already occurred. Frances McCormack, aged 53, had been badgered for bedroom tax after the death of her 16-year-old Jack, uh, son Jack Allen in 2013. A mother threatened with eviction from the house where her son took his own life was found hanged in the same spot. A handwritten note written 10 days previously was found in her bedroom, part of which was addressed to David Cameron on the hardship the bedroom tax was causing. In February 2016, Paul Dinashi, who suffered from severe mental health issues, had been declared fit to work after he failed to attend a work capability assessment. He was found dead at his home after an error saw his payment stop and he owed then more than £3,000 in unpaid rent. Upon realising their mistake, the council sent Mr Dinashi a letter telling him his benefits would be reinstated. But by the time it arrived, it was too late. It was found unopened in his flat along with his body. In September 2015, Ruby Urbax, age 59, she was found dead at her home on the 6th of September 2015 as a result of a heart attack. Her benefits were stopped without any investigation as she missed her JSA appointment whilst in hospital. After her discharge, she had received no money for five consecutive weeks of the £50 per week she would have normally received. She was also paying £20 per week in bedroom tax. On only £30 a week, she couldn't afford to feed herself properly, as bills, she thought, were her main priority. And there are people up and down the country that are experiencing the same sort of thing intentionally or knowingly reckless and de uh, depraved disregard for life, as per the definition from Rummel in the regards to democide. But you have to make your own mind up on what, what you think. No one, nor, no one, I can't tell you what to make of it. But remember, we are a first world country and these cases are a result of government policy. So when will it get better? When will we have a government that many of us could consider, one that cares and relates to everyone that walks our streets, the good citizens, the law-abiding, honest people that just want to make life better? Because it can be better, but only if we're united. Because united, we can have a better society and a better political system.